Hello and welcome to the world today. I'm very proud to have as our guest John Pilger, one of the finest investigative journalists in the world, who I have personally known for too long to mention. But there's one story I want to tell about him. When John first began to write regularly in the British press, his radicalism shocked even some of his friends. And I always remember Wilfred Burchett, a much maligned Australian radical journalist in the English media, who once grabbed hold of me and said, do you know John Pilger? And I said, yes, we've met. He said, give him a word of advice for me. And I said, what is that, Wilfred? He said, tell him to go easy. He's going too fast. Well, John Pilger didn't take that piece of advice from anyone and has subsequently written a great deal. Uh, too long, it would take too long to list his many coups, but one of them which left its imprint on the memory of the world was the exposure of Pol Pot's atrocities in Cambodia, exposed over several pages in the Daily Mirror when such things were possible, uh, and which embarrassed the West considerably because there was no, not much talk of humanitarian ideology in those days, and the United States and its allies were backing Pol Pot thoroughly. They left him his representative at the United Nations for several years. Uh, and John Pilger exposed that and much else. He's written extensively uh, as a journalist, but also as a writer, extremely successful books on Australia, on the world, on how corporations uh, run the world, etc. That's enough on that. John, welcome. Very good to have you with us. Thank you. And let's start by the discussing the state of the American empire. We're sitting not long after Donald Trump's uh, election, which has sent the liberal world into a frenzy of uh, grief, some manufactured, some real. How do you think this is going to affect the overall behavior of the empire? Well, the empire feels very threatened at the moment, actually shocked, shocked and threatened. That's a very interesting, uh, a very interesting situation. Um, some of them foresaw the election of Trump, Trump winning. I don't, most didn't. Some foresaw the British voting to leave the EU, but most didn't. So this is very unusual. And it's thrown into relief the, the whole um, perception of, of people and whether they can be continue to be controlled. Because what the Trump victory and the Brexit victory tell us is that millions and millions of people are rejecting this thing called globalization, the great so-called project of our time, the neoliberal project, the neoconservative con project, the neo-neo project, the modern capitalism is being rejected right across humanity. I mean, in the so-called developing world, it's long been rejected, yeah. of course. Long been rejected and debated and discredited, even though it's still there. But the, the conversation, if you like, of humanity, most of humanity has been rejected. This is new in the West, the so-called North, if you like. So there's panic. And that panic is... Uh, demonstrated mostly in the liberal world. Uh, the, one only has to look at the, the so-called respectable media in uh, Britain and, and the United States. What, the Guardian uh, and the New York the Times? Gar the Guardian, the New York Times, the Washington Post, well, all of them, really, all the networks, 
uh, in the US, the BBC, CNN, the whole lot. The, the coming of Trump to them has represented a kind of uh, a, a really unacceptable rebellion. So um, it, it's almost, you know, the, the, the association of Trump with, with, say, Germany in the 30s, I've read, the, the ludicrous kind of uh, uh, almost willful um, misunderstanding of this messy rebellion, but a rebellion it is, but they're panicking. Their woman uh, didn't make it, and so much was riding on her. They kept saying how experienced she was. Indeed, she was. She was experienced in all the rapacious policies that have, uh, that have exemplified the growth of the empire, particularly in the 21st century. She was the means by which globalization would keep going. Uh, she's gone now. That doesn't mean to say it won't keep going, and that doesn't mean to say that Trump won't keep it going. But there's a new conversation. There's a new threat. Um, and something has to be done about it. If Trump, in any form, I think, tries to go too fast and get rid of all the great trade um, uh, arrangements, TP, the prospect NAFTA. of a TPP, NAFTA particularly, that be then becomes something of a political earthquake. Um, so very interesting times. John, you've been working very concretely in the last 10 years on this globalization and empire uh, uh, projects. And you've been charting how the American empire operates in the rest mm. of the world, both on how it dominates Europe, not just politically, but increasingly mm. culturally uh, and in every other way. And of course, its impact in the Pacific region, in Africa, uh, mm. etc. Now, in the past, when they've got a president who they feel is slightly out of control for other reasons, like Reagan, mm. what they do is appoint the equivalent of an imperial politburo mm. to run the country mm. with him mm. as the front man. Mm. And they might be forced to do something like that with Trump. It would be harder with Trump. You could do it with Reagan. He was a very malleable character. Trump is different. Trump, uh, uh, whether you like the man or not, is his own man. Um, <laughs> I mean, that begs all kinds of questions, but he's, I, I agree with what you say. If there's, there's a problem with the president, um, there usually isn't. No. Because he wouldn't have got that far. No. That's the point. That's what's extraordinary about this. Trump has got this far. I mean, they were holding their breath when he was campaigning a year ago when he declared uh, there was a sort of nervous laugh about this sort of Greek chorus of, oh, oh what, where, is this, where is this taking us? When he was nominated, the fear set in. I think the system will in simply enclose him. The United States is run by a massive national security machine. Uh, it has to take note of the president, the president particularly with both houses of Congress on his side, and literally nominally, I'm sure they will be, they'll, they'll run to his, his, his power centre. So they'll have, to, they'll have to be other ways about it. Um, I don't know, it's a very, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, such a, it's been such a precarious time for all societies. It's now become uh, precarious in the sense that the, the rebellion uh, is being, uh, is being taken in certain directions that don't necessarily mean 
that people are going to benefit from them. In all rebellions, there are beneficiaries and there are people who lose out. This, this rebellion is uncharted. Um, so what they will do about him, I don't know. But it's, I mean, I, th I thought that what Trump might do, and he still might do this, is make, understand that he's sort of constrained domestically at this stage, he might go to Russia. Uh, I think that's more than likely, actually. Do Something a deal like with Putin. That, to do a deal with Putin. I think he will, because he can do that. It's like Nixon going to China. Yeah. He can do that. I mean, from the point of view of the United States, doing a deal with Putin is completely rational. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, what's <laughs> the problem? Well, there, I know. What is the problem? I mean, the danger is be if Putin was, in, as far as I can work out, if Putin himself was shoved aside in Russia and then the nationalists, those people who draw at that long well, deep well, I mean, of Russian pride and nationalism and militarism. Uh, but all Putin wants to be, as he keeps saying, keeps Is using it? this wretched word partner. I want to be a partner I of the know. United States. It's a, it, you, you know, he stopped almost pleading lately because it's become... They insulted him. He's, he's been so insulted over and over again, but he's desperate to be... He is. ...to, to he, de deals with the United States. And, I mean, the fact is that what annoys them about Putin is that he has started behaving as the leader of a sovereign independent state. Mm. Because after the 90s, they were used to Yeltsin, who did their bidding on everything. You're quite right, comparing it with Yeltsin. I mean, uh, they had their perfect man, a, a, a drunk who could be, who could be pretty well told what to do and uh, of course under Yeltsin the the new oligarchies emerged and and uh, plundered the country but it it mystifies many people in the west why Putin is so popular he has a rating apparently of reaching up to 90% uh, hardly anyone can match it. And the reason I think he is popular is that he restored Russia from the, 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 the chaos and the, uh, almost the destruction of the Yeltsin years. Um, now, that independence of Russia is intolerable. That, that's, for me, that's the, almost the litmus test of enemies, Thank imperial you. enemies. Any real independence, even a semblance of, of, uh, uh, of, of independence they is intolerable, unacceptable. And to have an independent Russia, uh, again, having restored its military industrial complex, certainly its military, into once again a highly sophisticated machine. So it's not only an independent power, it's one that could defend itself. That's unacceptable. Moving on to other matters, John, in the coverage of the Trump victory, it's very difficult to read in any mainstream newspaper mm. uh, the responsibility of Obama for this victory. Mm. That he's been a disaster on many fronts, even on the much praised front of Obamacare, healthcare, yeah. on deportation of immigrants. Obama deported 2.5 million immigrants. Yes. On building the wall in Mexico, Bill Clinton started actually doing that and Obama didn't dismantle it. So the things that, even the outrageous things that Trump has been saying are mm. part of mainstream narrative, mm. but never presented as that because mm. there's never any real analytical criticism in the press. So you would think suddenly that 
with Trump's victory that he emerged from nowhere. But he emerged because the situation in that country was appalling. Now, he could, of course, mend the breach with the Russians, which would be a step forward without any doubt. Uh, but in terms of the Middle East, Israel and Afghanistan, I mean, one has to keep watch, I think, to see what is going to happen in, in these parts of the world, because these wars have now been going on since mm. 2000 and, 2001, the invasion of mm. Afghanistan, and they're still at it. And the whole of Europe and the Western world doesn't mm. behave as if they are countries at war. Yeah. And they are countries at war, except no one talks about the war too much. You see, I take a slightly different view on Obama. I think in terms of what he was meant to be and what a president is meant to be, and especially a democratic president, uh, he was a success. Um, Obama uh, came in in a blaze of imagery. So we had an election by media. Uh, here was the first African-American president in the land of slavery. And there wasn't a dry eye anywhere. He managed to con the African-American uh, population of the United States. Obama was the embodiment of a kind of identity zeitgeist that is an essential ingredient of political control these days. So Obama began life by doing something no president has done. He took the entire top bureaucracy of the Pentagon, including the Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, who was Bush's, all of it discredited. They'd, they'd, they'd given us Iraq and everything else and transferred them to his Pentagon. No president had done that. He'd always chosen his own. Obama went to war. Uh, on whistleblowers, has prosecuted more whistleblowers than any president in history. Uh, George Bush only prosecuted about two, I think. I sometimes read and watch commentary on Obama, and I do believe we're living in a kind of virtual world. It is the diametric opposite applies. It is the inversion of the truth. That's why the media is so power, powerful because we get that distortion, that media world, that war by media, politics by media, feminism by media, everything else by media, we get that now as we've never got it in the past. It is probably the most powerful form of propaganda in my lifetime, insinuating everything. Perhaps not quite into our consciousness yet, though it's on the way. And Obama was the embodiment of that. So as far as the, the, the great national security establishment, your NSAs and the corporate world that really controls uh, the United States and much of its empire, uh, Obama was almost perfect. Um, of course, he was a disaster for the rest of the world. Uh, John, effectively what you're saying is that, and I agree with you on that, that Obama is the most inventive apparition to be created by the American empire, yeah. but he's now over. Yeah. And he couldn't replace himself with a feminist version of the same. Uh, no. uh, that, <clears throat> that didn't happen because she was far too discredited. But what if the Democrats, and it's a huge if, as we know, had had Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren as the Democrat candidates? Do you think Trump... I don't think so. I mean, see, the Democrat, the party, rigged the primaries. Yeah. They saw the threat in Sanders. They, they then saw the populism that Sanders represented. And the huge crowds. And the huge crowds, you know. A friend of mine telling me... A, the crowd he went to, he reckons there were about 20,000 people, a political meeting. It's unheard of, yeah. <laughs> uh, Sanders didn't deserve any of it, of course. Uh, I mean, he, he, the moment he got close to the centre of power, Clinton, 
uh, he was in full obsequious mode and, and supported her, uh, her th right through to the, to the election. So there's a lesson there too. It's almost another discussion. We've, we've seen that so many times when the, the liberal candidate, usually with a false moniker, calls him self a socialist and he's nothing of the kind with a, a kind of foreign policy that uh, uh, was pr probably more right wing than Trump's I would think but he was perceived as the people's candidate no doubt and he got that. what about 19 million votes something like that um, and interestingly many of those who voted for Sanders would have voted for Trump and many of those who voted for Trump, perhaps it's this way around much more, would have voted for Sanders. I don't think Sanders uh, would have won. Um, uh, but he certainly, if, if he'd had a clear run at the nomination and been nominated, he probably would have come pretty close, close if not. Yeah, because yeah. it was a close thing. Yeah. <clears throat> and that might, you see, what was very noticeable as well was that 49.6% of the electorate didn't bother to vote. No, isn't that, isn't that it's extraordinary? It's a huge number. Yeah. And that hasn't changed. You know, I, th I thought there'd be a turnout this time. There wasn't. But <laughs> the, the, the great American lack of yeah. understanding or unwillingness to take part in any kind of electoral event is, is entrenched. No, the you vote know? was higher for Obama, higher for Mitt Romney as well. Yeah, yeah. But this time I think people, for different reasons, were repelled somehow by both the candidates yes. and said, yeah. we're not going to vote, we're yeah. going to stay They were home. repelled. Yeah. They, were, they were both, in their own ways, absolutely odious. And, I mean, both Trump personally was close to being discredited before he got to election day. And, and Clinton, on just multiple levels, was discredited. Uh, and all the polls said no coup, two candidates were so, people were so contemptuous of them as they were of this pair. Uh, it's a truly amazing uh, situation. And I, I think we're, I suspect we're just at the beginning of the story. We are, without you know? any doubt. I mean, there's next year and the years that follow before this yeah. story pans out. John, a last word on India, for mm -hmm. instance. That, you know, we talk about Trump, we talk about uh, Brexit, etc., etc. But we have in India mm. a party and a government which is well to the right of Trump. Yeah and is accepted. I mean, it's really is oh, semi-fascist. It's applauded. <laughs> and <think>. applauded. <laughs> and it um, victimizes its minorities, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist. Uh, and it's heading in a pretty uh, awful way, actually, in a pretty awful direction. No one knows what's going to happen. I was talking the other day to a friend of mine in India, and I won't say where now, because the picture he painted was almost of a state of fear. He said, you know, even now, he's documentary maker, um, even pointing a camera in a rather innocuous way now will excite interest, as he said, in the, by the authorities. And he said, this has happened very, very quickly, where he's had visits, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Who are you doing it for? Uh, he said he'd never known that before. Now that's, I hadn't realized that until he no, described it most, most graphically, but he said it's, it's all over the place. And so this authoritarian, side to the Modi government um, is, well, it was demonstrated the other way, the other day when they just abolished two, two banknotes, yeah. the 500 and the, the 100 rupee, I think. Thousand. Thousand, was it? Thousand, sorry. Now, okay, it, they want to catch all the 
tax dodgers and the crooks. But as I, my knowledge of India is a lot of people who are in little people with businesses and everything who deal only in cash, cash exactly. would have wiped them out overnight. You know, that's, yeah. it's, uh, yeah. Predictions, I know we, we don't go in for predictions, but if you, one looks at the state of the world as a sort of now, it is pretty frightening and unpleasant. Yeah. And, I mean, apart from the Corbyn developments here, John, which are unusual, and I think a response partially also to what's happening in Scotland, but the picture we see in Europe is pretty appalling, really. Mm -hmm. In the North America, the same. In South America, where we had 10 or 15 years of Bolivarian experiments mm -hmm. on the decline, Venezuela in trouble, Brazil an effective constitutional coup, the Ecuadorians under constant pressure from the United mm -hmm. States on, on, on many issues. What do you think it will look like in 20 years' time, this world? I th I've never known um, awareness to be as widespread. I think people are aware. But they do stand back, rather like the Greek chorus. They don't, they're aware, but they don't know <coughs> what to do about it. I think it is a period... It's a very dangerous period, as you rightly say. But I think there is a level of consciousness among a lot of people, a lot of young people, particularly in poor countries. Uh, you know, there's, we don't hear about them. We didn't hear, we were talking about India, we didn't hear about the biggest mass strike ever not all that long ago, something exactly. like 150 yeah. million people on strike came out, and it was largely political. Um, so there, it's fragmented, but it does represent an awareness. Um, I know that in Latin America, the the so-called rollback is is enjoying some success, certainly in countries like Argentina and Brazil. But then, was there ever the confrontation of people with, up against their own illusions, to produce fragile social democracies in a part of the world that really cried out for not bloody, but real revolutions. Um, this was almost inevitable. And so although we're aware, our knowledge, our understanding is still limited. We still speak of Saritia in Greece as a, a radical party, and they're not. They were a treacherous... Uh, managerial, I would call them managerial party. Um, and their membership has now abandoned them. And the mem membership has abandoned them. Opportunism everywhere. So that has to be, that political understanding has to be reclaimed. But on the optimistic side, I think there is, among young people, they're receptive. They're receptive. They become receptive because it's, it's hurting them to go to university now. It costs a fortune in Britain or and in other countries. Job. Yeah, or a job. They can't afford anywhere to live. So their own circumstances, uh, I think, giving them that level of awareness, perhaps not consciousness yet, but there is something there. Now, I may just be an optimist, but there is something. John Pilger, thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs>